All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started just for the sake of time. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so we can make sure that it gets widely distributed to all our registrants, um, as well as posted online for, um, for access thereafter. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Marla Franco, and I serve as the Vice President of Hispanic Serving Institution Initiatives at the University of Arizona, located in Tucson, Arizona. Um, we are a Hispanic Serving Institution, um, federally designated as such in 2018. Um, and I am very excited uh, today and very pleased to be collaborating with the National Humanities Center uh, so that we can provide you all with an awareness about some of the fellowship and research opportunities available um, to folks across the nation. Um, even though we certainly want to make sure that this information gets out to faculty and staff, um, and postdocs at the University of Arizona, we certainly um, are big believers and supporters of collaboration across the nation so that information can be accessible um, to folks across the nation. We want to see lots of people taking advantage of these opportunities. So thank you all so much for, for joining us. We're going to do um, some a quick round of, of introductions, um, and then we will definitely be passing it over to our colleagues, affiliate with the National Humanities Center um, so that they can give us a, a really a thorough rundown of some of the opportunities available and certainly answer any questions that we all might have about some of these opportunities. So just wanted to thank you all and kind of give you a, a quick rundown of how we're going to spend our time this morning. So once again, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Um, I have worked at the University of Arizona for about 10 years now, um, exclusively in a career in public higher education for almost about 25 years now between California and Arizona, and have had the real opportunity um, to build out both institutional capacity as well as statewide and national capacity relative to uh, capacity building efforts that support HSIs across the nation. Um, so I'm super excited to be doing this work here at the University of Arizona. Um, I also serve as co-founder to what's called the AZ HSI Consortium, which is a community of practice of uh, statewide HSIs in the state of Arizona. Um, I like to say that we just turned 21. Um, so um, as of recent, we now have 21 HSIs in the state of Arizona. I also wanted to encourage you while I kind of had your um, undivided attention and just wanted to invite you, we really like to think about some of the capacity that we've built as open access resource and tools for the nation broad rip to take advantage of. So these are definitely not um, exclusive to our University of Arizona community, but really open to all. And so I provided the link um, at um, kind of the bottom of my signature here to the left with our website. Um, I highly encourage you to take a look at that. That will um, help you get a good uh, sense of kind of our major priorities and activities that we support out of the Office of HSI Initiatives. And I also wanted to invite you towards the right is really a visual that captures and highlights some of the communication modalities that we engage in quite regularly to make sure that folks across the nation are fully aware of some of the opportunities, upcoming activities and events. Many of the, the sessions that we host um, are often virtual, and so they are open to all. Um, all faculty, staff, um, students, administrators, community members, um, elected officials, you name it, um, they are open access. So we highly encourage you to take a look at uh, our suite of social media, whichever it is that you might follow. But we do have uh, a Facebook account, a Twitter account, as well as an Instagram account where you'll find uh, much of our information. There's also an opportunity to join a monthly electronic newsletter um, that also highlights uh, many of these upcoming opportunities. And there is um, a way for you to register for that online newsletter on our website. So I just wanted to make sure that those resources um, were shared with you and to encourage you to connect um, because they're open to all. 
So I am super excited um, to provide an introduction to our colleagues at the National Humanities Center. Um, it's a great opportunity, I think, to um, ensure that we're maximizing some of the opportunities that are available to us and certainly look forward to hearing more about uh, the variety of opportunities, kind of the timing of these opportunities, um, and how best po to position ourselves to apply and circulate these at our respective um, colleges and universities. So joining us today, we have Javier Villaflores, uh, who serves as an associate professor in the Department of Religion at Emory University. And then we also have Matthew Morse Booker, who serves as the vice president for scholarly programs with the National Humanities Center. And so I am actually going to stop uh, sharing my screen at this point um, and just read to you a little bit more about um, their background. So uh, Javier Villaflores uh, once again serves as an associate professor at Emory University. Uh, before his current appointment, he actually taught for 16 years at the University of Illinois Chicago, which is a very active R1 uh, Hispanic serving institution, um, one that the University of Arizona partners with quite frequently. Um, he's also also the author of Dangerous Speech, uh, A Social History of Blasphemy in Colonial Mexico, and serves as the co-editor of Emotions and Daily Life in Colonial Mexico, and From the Ashes of History, Loss and Recovery of Libraries and Archives in Latin America. He's actually currently working on a history of trust and public faith in 18th century Mexico. Uh, we also, again, have with us Matthew Morse Booker, who serves as the Vice President for Scholarly Programs at the National Humanities Center, where he runs the fellowship program. Uh, previously, he was Professor of History at North Carolina State University. Uh, he still actively teaches, teaches and publishes in agricultural history, environmental history, and the history of the American West. So we are super grateful to have both of you join us to share a little bit more about some of the opportunities um, that you're they're joining us to talk about today. So thank you both. I'll, I'll turn it over to you and uh, just let me know, um, make sure that we have, that you have the share screen privileges that you might need. Thank you so much, Marla. I think I'll start and then I'll hand off to Javier after a few minutes. Um, I, I really want to begin by thanking Marla and also Monique Beltran at the University of Arizona um, and Michelle Tellez at the University of Arizona, who put us in touch originally. I noticed that in your, your wonderful slide um, that you started with, that the word familia is central. And I would say that the word community is central for the National Humanities Center. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful to be connected to the, to the networks um, that you have offered us, Marla, and your program. That's something very important to me because at the National Humanities Center, the thing that I mat that matters most to me is that the transformative impact of fellowships is available to scholars at every institution, that scholars in the humanities and social sciences who have great ideas can find the support to write those ideas and publish those ideas um, here at the National Humanities Center. Um, and the person who can probably demonstrate that better than I can is Javier, and he can tell you a little bit about that um, in his own life. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I do have uh, three slides that I'd love to share. Folks, can you see the, the slide um, that I've just shared? Wonderful. Great. Um, well, um, the National Humanities Center is the only nonprofit residential fellowship program in the United States. And by nonprofit, I want to emphasize that we're not part of any institution, any university. There are wonderful humanities centers at Stanford, at Princeton, and at universities nationwide that support scholars. But we, as, a, as an institution that is not associated with any university, have a national role. We serve um, people from across the country and indeed around the world. Since 1978, we've supported over 1,500 fellows who have produced over 1,700 books and many, many articles. And um, those scholars have come from over 235 institutions worldwide, including the University of Arizona, which has sent a number of excellent fellows to the National Humanities Center. Um, but what I especially appreciate about this opportunity is the chance to speak to people who either don't know about residential fellowships in the humanities, our fellowship in particular, or maybe don't think that they are eligible to apply or that they have a chance. And I really want to insist 
that if you've got a great idea and you fit oh. our minimal eligibility requirements, that you would be a great fit here and we want you to apply. So what do we offer? We offer stipends. We work with home institutions um, to support your full salary while you're a fellow at the National Humanities Center. We offer fellowships for either one year or one semester, and that's up to the applicant how they wish to be supported for one or the other. Every single fellow at the center gets a private study. She, she or he gets a room of their own um, to write in and, um, and is supported with exceptional library services. Um, first class services that will bring to you in your office anything that you want that is published. Um, and we really tr do try to seek to be the very best in the world at that. We also offer a whole series of professional development opportunities, including, for example, conversations with editors at university presses or trade presses. Um, and we've done a series of those conversations for fellows every year. Um, most importantly, we offer community. About 35 fellows come to the center each year. They come from a huge range of backgrounds, fields, and disciplines. They also come from very different institutions and they're of different ages. And so what that means is that if you're a fairly junior scholar, you have the opportunity to mingle with people who are heavyweights, senior people in their field. And if you're a senior scholar, you have the opportunity to engage with people at the cutting edge, perhaps of your field or your discipline. So every scholar who comes here comes with an idea to write a book or to write a series of articles, but often those change during the time they're here. And I would I put lunch in there because that's our secret sauce. Um, lunch is when we ask our fellows to mingle. Um, otherwise, we leave you alone uh, during your day. So I'm going to advance my slide here and just say something about the actual process of applications. Um, our calendar, you know, Marla mentioned, what about timing? When does when does a person begin to need need to begin preparing their application for fellowship? Um, our applications open each year on July 1st. We have an online access portal. It's fairly straightforward. And we close that portal this year on October 5th of 2023. The application is fairly straightforward. It's a relatively brief proposal, a short bibliography, and a CV. We also ask for a one-page tentative outline of the structure of the project. So if you're proposing to write a book, we would like to see, you know, what might the chapters look like in that book? And if you're proposing a series of articles, as often happens in the humanistic social sciences or in fields like philosophy, then how might those, app, those articles work together? And I think most importantly, I've added two websites here, two links. Um, and of course, I'll share these, these slides with you, Marla, afterward. Um, but I hope folks can access these two sites. Maybe the easiest way to do it is simply to navigate to nationalhumanitycenter.org. And if you look um, on our home screen, we have information about the incoming class of fellows and also a link to become a fellow, which is uh, this site. And then I think finally what I'll say is um, this is the picture, but this is an actual study. And this is what they all look like, although we have recently replaced all of the glass doors. So they're even clearer and shinier. Um, this happens to be the study of my friend Tatiana Sejas who was a fellow in the year I was a fellow in 2016, 2017. I didn't ask her for permission to use this image, but it is on our website. And the reason I chose this one is it shows a person, a scholar um, in her habitat, you know, using the space, reading her books, engaging with the space and doing it as she wishes. And that's, that's what we try to offer. We try to offer a space in which everyone can be free to finish their work. So I'd be happy to talk more about the actual process of applications, but I don't wanna take up too much time. So maybe what I'll do is just skim it very briefly and then um, answer any particular questions you have. I think the, the critical point here is that our application process and our selection process has two phases. The first phase is that we send out all eligible applications to external reviewers. We have over a thousand people across the humanities who agree to review for us each year. Uh, and that's an extraordinary act of generosity. I think many of you know how much effort it is to be a reviewer. <clears throat> Those people are anonymous and they give excellent feedback on applications. From the roughly 500 to 600 applications we get each year, those reviewers help us sort it down to 100. And those reviewers are in disciplines. So they, they understand a project and the bibliography and what you're trying to do um, and the conversation you are engaging with. Then applications go to our selection committee, and that is drawn 
uh, from across the humanities. So we'll have six scholars representing very different uh, def, uh, uh, fields each year. And so the each application has to both speak to a discipline or to perhaps a topic. So for today, for example, we had a conversation about environmental humanities. If you're if that's the area in which you're working, you would want to appeal to people in that field and, and make clear that you're working on something that's significant. But it also has to appeal to a broad set of interested humanities scholars across the across the, the disciplines. And I think that makes for very interesting projects at the center. People who are both solid within their fields, but also have the ability to reach to the larger questions that animate us as, as humanistic scholars. Um, and then I have a couple of tips about strong applications, but in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just leave those written up here on the screen and note that I can answer specific questions about what it means to write a strong application. I think many of you understand based on what I just said about reviewers and about our process that avoiding jargon and really speaking to humanistic questions, larger questions, is important to make it into the final pool. Um, we do require letters of recommendation, and we give specific instructions about what we mean by a letter of recommendation in the application process, which again will open on July 1st. So um, I'll be happy to answer more questions after Javier has a chance to talk about the actual fellowship experience. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Marla, for this chance. Should I, should I try to share my, my screen? No? Sure, go ahead. And, and Matthew, just wanted to let you know that we already have some uh, a question in the chat. So we'll circle back to that after Javier presents. Um, but definitely, I encourage folks to get their comments and questions uh, ready for both Matthew and Javier. Can you see my screen? Yes, looks great. All right, so my, my question was, uh, why to apply? Why should you apply to the NHC? What can you expect to get out of this? Um, buenas tardes y buenos días. Eh, en español primero. Um, so let me start by sharing with you my, something that I find quite interesting. This is the, oh, let me see. Unfortunately, I stopped sharing because for some reason, my, Yeah. If I share my screen for some reason, my PowerPoint doesn't work. Let me, then I will have to, yes. Yeah, if you try sharing again, and if you kind of click on it, then you should be able to advance. Okay, let me do that. Give that a try. So I share my screen, mm -hmm. I click for the start. There you go. There you go. Yes. There okay. you go. All right, so I, I, I want to start our conversation with uh, this bulletin that was issued in 2015 when I got this fellowship. It says, UIC History are named a National Humanities Center Fellow. It was a big news at the time. Um, according to the bulletin, I was the fourth scholar from UIC to get this fellowship. So uh, that implied that um, since the center opened in 1978, only three scholars were awarded this fellow, this, uh, this fellowship. The last one uh, was a, a very important scholar of uh, African-American feminism. Uh, and she received the scholarship 20 years before I, I was awarded my fellowship. So it was a big deal. It was very rare. And this is very interesting. I, I, was, I didn't look for, need to look for this uh, bulletin in obscure archives. Uh, this was uh, still available. UIC still has it as something important as a highlight that uh, a faculty member was uh, pointed out <clears throat> a fellow. So this is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, you take a look at, um, at the list of fellows that have in their projects that have been funded since 1978. Uh, you will notice that we don't have many fellows of Latin American ancestry or Latinx scholars. Uh, to put it bluntly, we have been invisible uh, to the National Humanities Center, and, but to be fair, they have also been invisible to us, to the Latinx uh, community. So when I applied to the center, uh, which was about eight years ago, I didn't know anybody who had applied to the National Humanities Center. I didn't know anybody who knew anybody 
who had applied to the National Humanities Center. Um, I never saw ads of them to calls for, for applications in the traditional places, you know, journals for Latin American studies or Latinx uh, studies. None of my colleagues at UIC mentioned the center. Uh, I never heard from my advisor about the center. There was no reason for me to have it on my radar. It was pretty, pretty much, it was invisible to us. If you were a scholar of Latin America or Latin studies, there was no reason to, to keep uh, that as a possibility. So the question is, why did I decide to apply? Um, the, the reason the center was on my, finally on my radar was because I was invited uh, to serve in the National Humanities Center, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities as a, as a panelist uh, and as a reviewer. And I noticed that one of the applicants listed the National Humanities Center in the CV. And of course the question was, was this person already funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities? And it was explained, no, no, these are two entirely different things. Um, uh, so I, I was wondering, so what is the National Humanities Center? Where is it located? Who, who are these guys? It was then that I did a little bit of research and I decided to apply. It was by sheer chance, sheer serendipity. They were pretty much not on my radar. Okay, as a scholar of Latin America, I was very familiar, very familiar with, um, uh, with residential fellowships because uh, I'm, I'm a colonialist. So I knew about fellowships to consult uh, research libraries like the Newberry Library, the John Carter Brown Library, uh, the uh, the Huntington Library. In all these fellowships, you're supposed to uh, be in residence, you're expected to be in residence, and you want to be in residence to have access to their collections. The only reason you go there is because you have, want to have access to the rare books. Um, I also knew about non residential fellowships, and these non residential fellowships are those opportunities uh, to do research, uh, research wherever you need to. Uh, they just funding you. Uh, giving you the money so you can make it this happen. You have the Fulbright, the ACLS, the APS, all, all kinds of fellowships that are funding you so you can do your work, whatever it needs to be done. But the NHC is entirely different. It, it is different because they, this is, uh, they don't have archives, they don't have uh, special book collections, but they can put together a specialized library for you. If you ask them to, uh, in advance, uh, for the books that you need to hit the ground running. They will put together, if I remember correctly, Matthew, it's about 100 books, I believe, bef before you arrive, something like that. It, it, then the, the number of books is, is, is uh, ridiculous, but uh, you can have all that ready for you before you, you arrive. Um, the, they are asking you to be in residence uh, pretty much so you can focus on your work. They give you the time and the space to do that. And uh, they uh, certainly ask you to participate in all kinds of activities like the ones that Matthew described. At the time when, when I was there, uh, you were invited, but not necessarily expected to workshop your work. Uh, I encourage you to, to do that if you have the opportunity because you, have the, you can hear from other perspectives and you get new ideas about your own work. But your main duty, of course, if, if we're talking about duties of any kind, is uh, to do your own work. That's the only reason uh, we are there. Uh, something very important is that they also feed you and they feed you good food. Uh, if there's a weekly menu and the food is entirely different for each uh, day. And they give you um, also good coffee. What you see there is actually the picture of my mug, which I still keep fondly uh, because as a fellow, you have the right to auto mug. And all the mugs are, are, um, are hung in, in, the, in the kitchen. So the first thing you do uh, when you arrive in the center, I used to arrive at 8.30 was to grab my bag, my mug, uh, get a cup of uh, a little bit of coffee, have breakfast, and then go to my uh, uh, to my uh, studio. I had to also to check if there were any books for me ready to pick up, and then I start with my day. So around twelve o'clock, uh, we have lunch, and it is as Matthew um, mentioned already. Uh, it is during lunch that we had the best conversations, the most unexpected encounters. Um, I must say, I'm a historian. I love history. I love my field. But uh, the most interesting person, uh, persons I've met at the center are not historians. The, the most interesting conversations, the most interesting ideas don't come from historians. Uh, but at least uh, 
uh, that was my experience in the National Humanity Center. Uh, Matt is also a historian, so uh, he can see it. Um, he, he will be able to comment on this. Uh, but the issue is that um, it is during the, the lunch time that I had the opportunity, for example, to meet, um, just to give you a quick anecdote, Mark Posanza. He was a, a classic uh, a, a scholar, Roman uh, classic literature. And uh, it is in this conversation that he uh, directed me to literature about the crimes of omission, how they were connected to canonic literature, something quite obscure, very, very obscure that I only had the opportunity to, uh, to learn about because of lunch, because we were sharing a meal. It was very, very interesting. Um, we had all kinds of different conversations um, uh, during, during meals, uh, mostly connected to the topics of my, my colleagues in the my cohort. Uh, we went from Chinese eunuchs to Holocaust memorials, and all of these things had something to do with the direction in which I decided to teach and to do research in the future. For example, my encounter with uh, this other colleague who was working on Holocaust memorials uh, resulted in me incorporating new uh, readings for my memory course on post-memory, which is a, a crucial uh, concept. I mean, there are many, many examples I could uh, add to this. Just, just a quick, uh, a quick example. Um, as a fellow, um, I was really impressed by the efforts of the staff to create community. Uh, but also, all, all these fellows, the guys that you see on the left, is my cohort. It's a, this is very important. Um, but we we got along very nicely, but they were this attempt, this uh, con conscious effort to create uh, uh, activities where all, we all could participate. So I had the opportunity to uh, participate in poetry readings, of course, uh, as, uh, listening to, to them in board games. We all I went, went for walks. Uh, I also went for a run and I found a great running partner in John Smith, we used to run together. Uh, what you see in the middle is one medal that I got for a, a half marathon around with him, which was very nice. Uh, the picture on the, the right is the, um, April Mastin was an amazing, amazing scholar of dance. Uh, she, uh, at the time, was working on square dance and then she taught us how to dance square. Square dance are very interesting steps and we all applied our learning to the, to the party that we had at the end. Uh, you see me playing the, the guitar there because we also sang. So I accompanied her. Uh, she's singing one of the important songs uh, that her father uh, created as a, um, you know, an organizer that is down in the kitchen. So that's a very interesting thing. Um, so um, I enjoyed really every minute of my stay in the, at the NHC. Uh, the staff was fantastic. My colleagues were also very, uh, very nice. I had the, uh, the opportunity to interact and come up with new ideas because of my presence there. And I really encourage you to apply. Uh, I wanted this to be incredibly brief because it's just a quick introduction. What is really important, what comes next? So and see how, what we, how we can help you to put together uh, strong proposals. So, thank you. Yes, well, thank you so much, Javier, for um, sharing a bit about your experience. I think it both, you know, captured, um, you know, some of the scholarly works that you engaged in, but also, you know, the connections and the real formative times in community with your colleagues. And so uh, thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, I suppose now, Matthew, we can open it up to some Q&A and conversation. I know that there was um, one question already submitted um, in the chat. So can an applicant receive feedback on the proposal in case the proposal was not accepted? accepted. Also, does the NHC consider the institutional type when reviewing the applications, for example, R1 versus Regional Comprehensive Teaching University? Great questions. Thank you so much, um, Young Im, for asking those. Um, yes, an applicant can ask us for feedback after the application um, system has completed, and I should have explained our calendar. Um, we Applications are submitted by October, and then we hand them out to reviewers and they go through their process. The entire, then the selection committee gets the materials they meet here at the end of January. By end of February or sometimes more often mid-March, um, depending on how fast people respond, the application 
the complete selection process is over. And at that point, that would be a good time to write us and to ask for any feedback. The feedback we can offer is that we will offer you the reviewer comments, those original experts within the field comments. Um, of course, their privacy is very important. So we redact their names um, and anything that might identify them. Um, and we do that because we, we want you to be treated fairly and we want them also to have the ability to speak honestly and, and truthfully. So um, absolutely, you would write to us. Um, we don't broadcast this information because we had 540 applications last year. So it becomes kind of overwhelming, but I'm broadcasting it to you and to everyone on this, on this um, call. Please ask us um, in April um, for feedback and we'd be happy to provide those. In terms of, of institutions, um, the center has made a, a real effort to broaden the base of institutions and of scholars supported in those schools. So we have a fellowship actually, which is only available to those who are at um, liberal arts or four-year schools. We also have um, you know, a, a few fellowships which are only available to those at HBCUs. And I'm hoping to raise the funds to fund somebody at an HSI. And <laughs> this, is, this is step one, but you know, um, but everyone is available, everyone is eligible to receive all of our of all of our fellowships. So those targeted fellowships are an addition to the fact that anybody from any institution is eligible for all of our fellowships. Um, the way that we take those into consideration is that we look for our selection committee considers a diversity of disciplines, geography. Um, we're looking, so we're looking to represent the humanities broadly, institutional types, and so on. So we think of diversity in a very broad sense, um, representing the breadth of the humanities and how they have they have uh, broadened over time. Very good. Other questions or comments for both Matthew and Javier? Uh, Matthew, uh, there was also this issue about, uh, do you make a difference between Air One versus Regional Comprehensive Teaching University? We support fellows from, from all institutions, liberal arts, four-year colleges, tribal colleges, HSIs, all institutions at all levels um, uh, without discrimination. Um, I will say that we probably get more applications from our ones because of the problem that Javier identified. And that is you have to know about the NHC in order to apply. And most of our applicants come through word of mouth. Most of the people who apply, even though we advertise broadly and you will see now that you know about us, you're gonna see our advertisements out there on social media and in a variety of other forums. Um, nevertheless, it's when someone tells you about us, most commonly that people apply. So that's the problem we have, Javier, is that more people apply from our ones than from any other institutional type, but we're making a difference now. Either, maybe Javier or Matthew, maybe you can each speak to this, right? I mean, it's certainly, you know, you mentioned, you know, over, over 500 applications, right, is what you had received for, you know, X number of spots. Um, maybe Javier, I mean, did you, were you accepted to the fellowship um, on your first attempt? Um, what, what elements perhaps of um, your proposal, your application, did you feel um, made you perhaps a competitive candidate? And, and Matthew, maybe on your end, you know, what are you seeing kind of big picture thematically, right, as some of the, um, you know, kind of short-sightedness perhaps that, that um, might be good recommendations for people to really zero in on as they, they think about applying? I, I had a great fortune of uh, being uh, awarded the first time that I applied. But I, I believe um, I had some idea about what makes a strong application. Uh, Matthew, you would be able, uh, please correct me if I, um, you, you don't agree. Uh, I had also the opportunity also to uh, uh, serve at the National Humanities Center in two different stages as a first round reviewer and also in the selection committee at the end. So I have a, an idea of how, what we're, uh, we're looking for. Uh, I think it's uh, very important that uh, we the, the project state clearly the significance of the of the topic, uh, the significance in the, in the humanity, in the, in the humanities, and to state clearly why the project is innovative. Is it, is it does this innovation come from sources, new sources? 
Is it uh, new approaches? Um, is there a new methodology? What, what makes your project different? What, what makes it to stand out? It is very, very important to ground the project. To I say clearly how this project is connected to ongoing conversations in your field. So who, who are your interlocutors? Who are you talking to? What kind of conversation do you want to start? This is very important. You think that the scholarship is like entering a room where everybody's talking. Uh, so try to identify the most important voices, the voices that are starting new conversations. And perhaps you can tell us, you know, what kind of new conversation you want to start. This is very important in connection to the significance of your project. Uh, now I would also add um, the feasibility. You need to demonstrate, I think, or to show convincingly that this is a feasible project, I think, uh, Matthew. I mean, uh, you need to, is your project well out, outlined? Uh, can you, have you said it clearly what has already been done, what remains to be done? Uh, this, kind of, this kind of issues are issues are very important. As much as possible, I will also um, recommend establishing your expertise, but this is, or your competence to carry out this project. And the best way to do that, in my, in my experience, uh, uh, is uh, indicating clearly how this project is building upon what you did before. How this project is a continuation of the kind of scholar who you're already uh, in becoming in your field. So your previous disability should be a platform to establish your authority in the field, your authority to carry out this project. And perhaps uh, the last issue, and this is very important, this is clear, uh, cl close to our heart in the, uh, people in the humanities, you know, what, what is the larger import of your, or your project? What is the larger uh, contribution to the humanities? What would you like to, to, to address? What would like uh, people to take as, as, as a big takeaway of your project? Here, uh, all of us are, are experts. I, I mentioned the importance of focusing, narrowing, establishing the, you know, the innovative nature of your field, um, but it is very important that we also are ambitious. We also, there's someone to fly, someone to embrace, uh, you know, to, sh to show a larger ambition, you know, emphasizing interdisciplinarity, of course, in the humanities. So th that's my take. That's my take. You can see why, how lucky we are to have Javier as an ambassador. <laughs> and, and I would note what he said at the beginning. Javier has had an experience as a fellow, that is to say, as an applicant who was successful. He was also a reviewer. For our, in our first phase of applications. He has admitted that, outed himself, and he served as a selection committee member. So he actually has seen all of the phases of the application process. So I, I think his words are extremely important. I guess I would, I would add two things to that, Javier, and Marla, I hope I'm, I'm capturing all of the question. Um, the first is that Javier is unusual in that he was successful in his first try. Um, one of the things I, I really hope from applicants is that they don't give up. Um, and as an example, Javier then is the unicorn, but the average applicant perhaps is the very senior scholar in literary studies from an eminent university who told me two years ago that they had, he told me that he had applied nine times before he was accepted at the center. Now, no doubt, listeners, you will, you will be more like Javier who, who slid right in here on his first application. But I, I want to note that that, you know, when you look at the odds for these fellowships, that it's important to be persistent. And this perhaps goes to um, Young M's question also about you know, seeking feedback from reviewers. We don't recycle reviewers. So if you, are, if you receive feedback from a set of reviewers the first time, you're not going to get the same reviewers the second time. And the positive side of that is, if, um, is that you have another chance, a totally fresh slate. The selection committee will also be different than it was the first time. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing I would say is, is about the stage of application. You know, Javier said, um, he implied this, but are you ready to write? Are you done with your research? Have you prepared a clear outline? Can you prove that you're ready to go, that all you need is a room of your own and lunch and a community of scholars um, and time in order to finish your, your book or your articles? That's really important. That's because many of our reviewers are former fellows and they're thinking about, you know, who needs this fellowship right now? For that person who applied those nine times, I suspect it was because he wasn't ready to write um, the first few times. Yeah, very good. Uh, Matthew, we have some additional questions in the, the chat. Um, 
uh, so Young Im, uh, I heard for any NEH or NSF applicants are encouraged to contact program officers to discuss their proposals before submission. Um, how about with NHC? Well, it's a little different with us in that the National Science Foundation, which I, by the way, have been rejected by several times in my mm -hmm. life. So, you know, um, you're among friends if that's your case. Um, the NSF has a much larger staff. Uh, than we do, and they they operate with with actually smaller numbers of applications for their fellowships. So I cannot read applications in advance. It is my great regret. On the other hand, I am thrilled to talk to potential applicants about the major questions that they have. Um, you know, and the most the question I most appreciate is the applicant who says, "Am I ready to apply? Um, will I be rejected out of hand? Am I eligible?" Um, and what I Usually the answer is actually no. You you would be a good applicant. Please do. So so I especially appreciate those contacts. Um, and my email address I'll provide in the chat here in a moment so people can reach me. It's also on our website. Um, and I would I would be happy to to chat with people. I can't pre-read your application. On the other hand, just so you know, um, whether this is good news or bad news, I have absolutely no vote in the process. So. <laughs> Unlike some institutions where you can, you know, that I would put my finger on all of the best applicants, the best applicants, and they would come. Um, I'm I'm on the outside looking in. I facilitate the process, but but I don't make a selection. Yes, and very optimistically, Young M indicated uh, yeah. that they've uh, only been denied once, so they have a few more times to go. Good attitude. Yes. Other questions or thoughts? I'm, I'm curious, maybe, perhaps maybe others might have this curiosity, but just kind of thinking about, um, you know, both Matthew and Javier, you indicated um, just kind of a, a point of readiness um, for folks um, that is important to thinking about when to uh, begin applying for this fellowship. Um, I'm curious um, to see about how it might intersect with one who is thinking about their promotion and tenure process at their respective institution and the value that an experience like this might bring to that process. Do you have uh, any thoughts? Yeah, um, Matthew perhaps might be able to answer this, but if I'm correct, uh, uh, the, the center doesn't fund uh, first book projects, uh, right? I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's only for uh, the second uh, book, uh, with the exception of philosophy. I believe in philosophy, you have a fellowship for early careers, but. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Perhaps Matthew, you can answer this more. No, and, and Javier has, has 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 put his finger on something very important, but also a bit difficult to explain. So I, I want I appreciate the opportunity. Um, we don't support dissertation projects. So a, a first book, which is built on a dissertation, is not supported by National Humanities Center fellowships, and that's a big that's a big category of people who are seeking support. Um, and the reason for that has to do with our origins, way back in 1978, that the center is a place that really builds around community. So the idea is that the people who come here are already successful writers. They have demonstrated the ability to complete a major project, to finish that project and to get it into publication. So in, in general, what that means, Javier is correct. In general, our applicants are publishing a second book or a second major project. Now there are some really important exceptions though, and these have increased in recent years. Um, one is that we have dedicated fellowships. We had a program through the Mellon Foundation and now through our partner, the United Negro College Fund, Mellon Programs, to support scholars at HBCUs. Those scholars have tended to be more junior, and we have, in fact, supported um, first book projects from those. Mm -hmm. We frequently have assistant professors who are working on a second major project um, at the center. And in some cases, I'm afraid, some institutions, um, I guess I'm putting my heart on my sleeve here, but some institutions um, in the Northeast are now requiring more than one book for tenure, which I find astonishing as a scholar myself. But in any case, sometimes a second book is still um, a, a tenure book uh, in those for those folks. And then finally, Javier mentioned that we do have a very special fellowship for junior female philosophers. It was endowed by a very great philosopher 
Philip Quinn and his friends. Um, he had remarked, I think, in his career, he had spent a great deal of his time um, attempting to write uh, what he saw as a real problem in the field of philosophy, which was the absence of women. And so he and his friends endowed a fellowship, which is for junior female philosophers, for people who identify as female and who are um, early career. And that application is open to, to, to really any philosopher um, uh, who, who holds the PhD. Um, so, and there are a specific description of that on our website. Great. There's um, there are a few more things in in chat. So um, I'm working on two book proposals. While writing the project proposal, may I mention both or one at a time? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's. Um, I mean, Javier can actually speak to this as a selection committee member. Mm -hmm. My own experience, having read, um, I do read all of the applications, and I assign the reviewers. Um, and I would say that um, the most successful applications focus. They focus on a single project. They emphasize the, the need to, for time to finish this project and to push it across the finish line. But Javier also mentioned the, the, the ability to speak about one's preparedness and status. Uh, that is to say, your, you know, the exciting ideas that you have. So maybe I'll let you, you, you speak to that, Javier. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I guess you don't want to come across as uh, somebody who's dispersed. It's very important to stay as focused as possible to show that you are certainly competent uh, or to carry out the project. But um, if this other uh, book project is connected to the one that what you want to carry, carry out, by all means, mention it because it is connected. But if that is not the case, uh, then you it's going to do a disservice, I think, uh, to it might uh, come across a little bit too all over the place instead of just staying quite focused. Um, that, that would be my take. We also have uh, um, two questions. So I see on the website that you have a program for science, technology, and art. Does this mean the applicant would be applying to a specific track or make a separate application? And then the second question, what kind of success do public humanities projects, digital humanities and or creative works have? Or is it mostly books and article collections? These are wonderful questions, terrific questions and ones that we think about a lot here. And I'm thinking about right now, actually, as I prepare changes to our frequently asked questions, I, I adapt them each year. Um, we do have a brand new fellowship, speaking of specific fellowships, a brand new one funded by the Burroughs Welcome Fund for the intersection of humanities, arts, and sciences. It's a really interesting project. Um, our first fellow is listed on our website um, uh, coming in this fall, Ana Mariela Basigalupo, who is an, an anthropologist. Um, that program, like all of the others at the center, has exactly the same application requirements. The application is the same for all. We're looking for humanities scholars, people who think deeply about humanistic questions. Mm -hmm. So you might be a hydrologist, as was the case a few years ago, a scientist, but you're writing a, a book with really humanities questions in it, and who are preparing a long-form, serious effort that requires the support of our libraries and our staff for six months or a year. Um, so that is the same application uh, for that fellowship as the others. And then about public humanities projects, digital humanities and creative works, this is a great question. Of course, the line between scholarly work and arts is sometimes fine or fuzzy. Um, in general, the center does not support creative projects, by which I mean a novel or artwork, but scholarly work can include a personal voice. And, and I think we can probably all think of some of our favorite examples of that kind of work. Um, we had a um, our one of our peer institutions supported um, a journalist who wrote a really important book mm -hmm. that led him into, into the academy. I'm thinking of our own trustee, Hector Tovar, who is at UC Irvine now. Hector was a journalist who wrote a really powerful book, which led him into the academy. Um, so there, this is not an easy question to answer, but we do try to do so in our frequently asked questions on the website. We give some examples of, of, of the kind of work that we support. And then finally, I would say about public humanities work. I myself um, have done a lot of digital humanities work, and it's very important to me that the broad spectrum of scholarly work in the humanities is eligible for support. I think it will be important for any writer working on that kind of topic to make clear to reviewers how it's scholarly, 
how it engages with in a conversation, as Javier put earlier. You know, who are you speaking with? And how is the armature that we expect from scholarly work, like footnotes, how can you incorporate that into your work? Um, I'm sure some of you would have had the same conversation around tenure and promotion. Um, you know, how do we review, for example, public humanities work? Um, some of that same kind of language is helpful, I think, from the American Historical Association or the Modern Language Association in, in thinking about how to sell, how to, how to tell others the humanistic value of that kind of, of public humanities scholarship. Well, I know we are, we've got a, a few more minutes um, to round out the hour, but certainly if there are um, any additional questions or, or comments, I invite you to kind of get them in before we close up. Um, but certainly wanted, I think a lot of folks are expressing gratitude in uh, the comments, uh, Matthew, um, for being able to kind of share information um, from the Humanities Center. And certainly I think it speaks volumes, Javier, to be able to um, you know, have a, a fellow join us and speak about their experience and their application um, process and uh, also the wealth of, of experience that uh, you brought to the table in applying for the program, given that you had served in various capacities with the program prior to your application. So I think it's been very informative to people uh, joining us. So any any maybe last questions, thoughts, comments? Marla, I did throw something else into the chat, <laughs> which is that the center has other, other roles beyond our fellowship program, as much as I think of this as the core of what we do and who we support. Um, we also have a very active education program, and that program has resources that might be of great interest to everyone on this call. Um, for example, the Los Angeles Unified School District, with over 20,000 K-12 through teachers, um, has sent thousands of its teachers to our webinars for professional development opportunities. Those are free, um, and those allow teachers to have extraordinary opportunities to engage with the highest scholarship being done in the United States in, a, in the humanities in a way which is accessible. We also have summer institutes, podcasting institutes that we co-sponsor with San Diego State University, um, and professional development opportunities. So I would just say those are not in my area of the center, but I'm very proud of that work because it draws on scholars like Javier, who come here to work on a book or on a project and along the way demonstrate, collaborate with the, those education programs. So just as the line between teaching and scholarship can be fuzzy, so too is it here. Yeah, thank you for sharing that opportunity. We might have to do a follow-up webinar and have your colleague, your associate join us to talk more about that program. But I know certainly there are many folks as well within the humanities and social sciences where their um, scholarship, research, and service intersect with um, engagement um, uh, with um, educators and K-12 communities. So thank you for sharing that. Good. Well, I want to certainly thank you, uh, Matthew and Javier, for joining us uh, for your agreement to collaborate on this webinar, for our attendees for joining us. We will be making this recording available to all registrants of this workshop and also posting it to our YouTube channel where it can be widely disseminated um, to colleagues. So um, certainly I hope that we have helped um, collaborate in a way that helps promote and support greater awareness about these fellowship opportunities um, because we certainly want to see um, faculty and, and uh, works being supported supported by those um, who are at HSIs. And so Matthew, I think you had given some inkling uh, towards the beginning of this session about a desire to kind of maybe do some fundraising, have some earmarked efforts um, in collaboration with HSIs. And certainly as we see a growing number annually of Hispanic serving institutions, um, it certainly I think would, would be put to, to good use. So. Here's to that. Yes. Marla, thank you for, to you and your colleagues for your leadership. Um, and for allowing us to have this opportunity. It's a, it's a great honor. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to collaborate. Well, we'll see you all and we will definitely be in touch with you in your email inbox. So be looking out for a link with the recording. But thank you all for joining us. We'll see you hopefully soon. And hopefully Matthew at some point comes across uh, your fellowship application. All right, thank you all. Bye.